Hello, my name is Astrid Schmulian and with me today is Stephen Kutsia. We are both lecturers on an introductory course to IFRS and this is an IFRS for Rookies presentation. The purpose of this presentation is to provide you with a brief overview of IS36, Impairment of Assets. As this presentation is intended for IFRS rookies, we will not consider cash generating units in this presentation. The accounting process is triggered by an economic event. In the context of IS36, this economic event is an impairment of an asset as a result of events such as decrease in market prices or physical damage to the asset. This event results in a decrease in the economic benefits expected to flow to the entity and accordingly the carrying amount of the asset needs to be reduced. As is evident above where impairments are explained in terms of the asset elements definition, IS36 is based on the concepts contained in the conceptual framework. Given that IS36 was originally issued in June 1998 and revised in 2003, it may be argued that the concepts contained in the 1989 framework are most applicable. IS36 requires an entity to annually consider if there is any indication of impairment of assets during the reporting period. In some instances, the standard requires an annual impairment test as well. An impairment loss should be recognised when the amount that an entity expects to recover from a specific asset is less than the carrying amount of that asset. This principle is based on the concept that an asset generates future economic benefits. These economic benefits could be generated through the continued use of the asset and or the sale of that asset. An impairment loss is generally recognized in profit or loss, where, in addition to a revaluation, an impairment loss should be recognized on a revalued asset. The accounting treatment of that impairment loss is in line with the accounting treatment of a revaluation deficit. As the carrying amount of the asset is written down to the asset's recoverable amount, the future depreciation over the remaining use for life will change. Estimates used in the calculation of depreciation should also be revised. It may then subsequently happen that an event occurs such as a recovery in market prices, which may be indicative of a possible recovery in the asset's carrying amount. As the future economic benefits associated with this asset have now recovered. Accordingly, IS36 requires an entity to annually consider if there is any indication that an impairment loss or part thereof needs to be reversed. The recoverable amount of an asset might increase due to the passage of time. In such cases, the service potential of the asset did not change and the previously recognized impairment loss should not be reversed. If all requirements are met and an impairment loss is reversed, a limitation exists regarding the maximum reversal. The reversal is limited to what the carrying amount of the asset would have been had no impairment been recognized. A reversal of an impairment loss is also generally recognized in profit or loss. Where a previously recognized impairment loss on a revalued asset is reversed, the accounting treatment of the reversal is in line with the accounting treatment of a revaluation surplus. As the carrying amount of the asset is increased to the asset's recoverable amount, taking the limitation into account, the future depreciation over the remaining useful life will change. Estimates used in the calculation of depreciation should also be revised. 
Impairment losses or reversals thereof are disclosed in the related assets notes. Detailed disclosure of the event leading to the impairment as well as information on the recoverable amount is required. Although not addressed in IS 36, impairment losses are non-cash flow items for purposes of the statement of cash flows. We hope you enjoyed this IFRS for Rupees presentation and look forward to engaging with you on Facebook.